Someone You Should Know, a program about people you know and even more that you don't. Hosted by Stuart Sachs, veteran, husband, father, and grandfather. Now, here's your host, Stuart Sachs. Well, welcome to another edition of Someone You Should Know. I'm awfully glad that you're with us today because we're going to have a good conversation uh, with a, a good new friend that, that I've made. And I'm I'm going to be very inquisitive about this show because it's, it's a subject that I just don't know that much about. And that's a good thing for you who are watching. We are brought to you today by our good friend Irving Chung, who is an expert at at all things having to do with, with uh, franchises. If you have ever had the even smallest thought about, gee, what would it be like to have a franchise? You need to reach out to Irving just to ask those questions because I think it will really surprise you that there are franchises that are very affordable. A lot of them you can do part-time and I'll reach out, have a consultation with Irving Chung. Everything about franchises. Well, I often do shows and I pride myself in, in having some knowledge about most of my guests and the subject that we're going to be talking about. I honestly can tell you this show ain't one of them because we are going to be talking about artificial intelligence. I am a complete, you know, in the dark about it. And that's why I connected with Ben Gold. Because Ben is an expert on AI, and he is going to enlighten me, and I hope he will enlighten all of you about what AI is and what it can do for you. We're going to be co covering a lot of subjects. So I guess the first thing, the natural question, Ben, is what is AI and when did it you know, really pop onto the scene? So great. First, I'd, I'd like to do, thank you for letting me on your show or inviting me. And I wanted to give a quick background and then I would love to address your question. So I come Please. from, so I come from 20 years of, of technology experience. The last five years, I worked on an AI application for the company that I work for. And I've just been really fascinated with the ability to crunch large amounts of data and be able to give actionable insights. That's really what AI is about. Now, on your specific question here, um, this is, uh, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, it's been around for decades. So AI has been something that is, has is, if you're talking about Google search or when you're on Netflix, it recommends the next movie or with Amazon recommending another product. That's all AI being used in the background for large corporations. Now, okay. gen generative AI, which is we're talking chat GPT and these other apps that are that are generating text images and videos, that is what is new and what is disruptive to pretty much the global economy. Now, that is the concept of generative AI is that we're working with what are called LLMs or large language models. And so ChatGPT, if you look at the paid version, it looks at a trillion data points. And therefore, what it does is it anticipates the next word. So if I were to say yesterday, love was, it would automatically know such an easy game to play because it's, it, it knows that that's the context of how it's used and would give me the, the rest of the song, would give me context about the Beatles because it has that large library of information and that gives it what we I put in 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 quotation marks intelligence. It allows people to generate content, to do blogs, to write websites, and that is transformative today because tasks that used to take hours can now be done in minutes. So, so you mentioned Chat GPT. What is GPT? Generative <laughs> pre-trained transformers. So the GPT is this idea of, of basically being able to, uh, to, to crunch this large amounts of data and be able to give content in a different way so than, than what we've been able to do in the past. So 
the let me say it a different way. The AI over the last decades has been something for large corporations. Generative AI is the democratization. So what it means for the end user is that I now can come and I don't have to be a programmer. I don't have to be a data scientist, but I can simply understand this uh, 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 a concept of prompts and contextual data, and I can generate really impactful personalized content. You know, it's interesting what you said earlier, and I never, I never really thought about it. But when we talk about Google uh, and and uh, you know some of the other apps that we've been using for a long time, I never kind of thought of that in a category of artificial intelligence. But you're right when you when you go to Google search and you type in you know uh, curtains, uh, you know it will it will on your screen show you different companies and all that, that work in customized curtains. And, and and I never really thought about the fact that that really was the beginning of AI uh, and all, because today when we talk about AI, it just seems like it's something that is out there in the universe and we we are looking to harness it uh, and, and, and bring it in, into the fold. Uh, and, AI, you mentioned something like taking trillions of pe- pieces of data and having that available inst- almost instantly. Is is there a concern uh, uh, about that? Be- because there is so much out there uh, and, and how are we going to use it? That is a fantastic question. And I can talk about the concerns in different ways. One of the areas that I've specialized, because that part of my story, which I'll, I'll continue here, is that the beginning of this year, I was let go from the employer I was working with, and I started this journey of applying for jobs and using chat GPT to personalize my cover letters, my interviews. I decided quickly to, dis- to set up a startup company that made the life easier for job seekers, and I began, interv- in, uh, I began also... Uh, interacting with the job seeker and career counselor communities. And what I found was, and this is the part you're describing about concerns. My biggest concern when we're talking, we'll we'll forget about society. I can do that in a minute. But from a job seeker and job market point of view, the biggest concern I've got is that this generative AI is is transforming and disrupting industries and uh, my message to anybody on this call is if you do not have an account with ChatGPT, put this on pause, go to, just type in ChatGPT in the in your search bar, go to OpenAI, and it's very easy to set up a free account. The fact that we have a technology that can take what, what a year ago we would, you know, if I were to write a blog, it might take me four or five hours. I might need t- uh, a decade or so of experience to really be a, uh, to be able to generate that kind of content, now suddenly a robot can do that in literally a minute. And all you have to do is give it good data. Give it, say to it, I want you to write a blog about Cuban cuisine that is in Florida and base it on the 1960s. And it will actually be able to give you a, a five or six paragraph discussion of that of that level of an, of an element. Now, what I teach people is, is that the, there's two things you need to master to understand generative AI. One is prompting. And I'm, I don't know if you've heard of this concept of a prompt engineer, but a prompt is a command. Uh, some, some people I've spoken to say, well, you know, I tried that chat GPT and it didn't really work for me. And I'm like, well, it's kind of like sitting in front of a car. And if you don't learn how to turn the key and to go and drive, obviously the car by itself sitting in your driveway is not particularly useful. So to understand how to drive generative AI is, is that is the uh, prompt is your command, knowing how to say, look, I, you are a, a top career coach. I am now applying for an important job. And that is step one. Step two is contextual data. Even with a trillion data points, it doesn't know who Stuart is, doesn't know who Ben is. So you can supply it with a resume and say, and a job description. Now you're giving it two data points, a resume and a job description. Now I can say, is am I uh, give me a compatibility analysis 
Okay, it'll say you're 80% compatible. Tell me my strengths. Tell me my weaknesses. Write me a cover letter. Wow. And it will generate that. So, and I'm using that example, but I'll, I'll share with you that, that for example, I was writing a business plan. I said, you are Tony Robbins. I need to write a business plan. What are the questions you need to know about my business to give me advice? And it'll give me 15 questions. Who's your audience? What are you doing? What's your product? What are you... and and then it will generate an outline and they'll say, well, can you expand on this or on that? It's like a, your own personalized coach. And the thing is, is that I meet a lot of people who are either own a business or they're looking for a job or they're employed. And I'm like, you need to learn, master this because you need to learn AI to get a job. You need to learn AI to keep your job because the, the, your employer is going to be hiring people who is going to say who wants to leverage these tools that can literally, and I, I sound like a used car salesman, but make you five five times more efficient on certain kinds of tasks. That is a really big deal, and so for and the reason why this is so important is is that is that there are people that have these twenty or thirty years of experience, and they're they're being replaced, and they don't know why, and they are sending resumes out, and they're getting rejected, and I'm like, have you you know? When you understand what this technology does, you might need to reinvent yourself because if you're a graphic designer and you're not using Midjourney or Dolly, which are these image, I can write right now, I can literally type in two phrases and come up with these amazing AI generated images that two years ago, you would have to, you know, you would pay someone hundreds of dollars to generate, to create those kinds of, of, of artwork or pictures. So this is the thing that's transformative. And I try to make this like, I feel like I'm Morpheus talking to Neo. Here's the red pill. Take it, please. Because then you'll, you, this will no longer be this, this, this like, uh, how do I say this cloud? Understand it and then say, how do I thrive in it? Well, and I think what you just said too is what AI will give you the ability to do is instead of just coming up with a standard resume, Depending on the company that you may wish to apply for, you can go back to AI and tweak it so that it will be more specific to that job seeking position. Absolutely. And this is this is for everything. So like I talk to sales reps and I will show them a technique like you're about to have an, a meeting with this this gentleman, uh, let's just say for whatever you're selling, whether it be uh, food services or a uh, software. And I will show them how to take your profile, take their profile and say, find five icebreaker conversations. What do we have in common? Uh, what are their most likely questions they're going to have me? Because this is my product. This is what it does. What do you think are going to be their top three objections? Or I have an interview. What do you think my top three questions are going to be? And that's what AI can do is it can take any kind of situation and turn it into a personalization discussion. So, so if if I'm going to have this interview with this this person in 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 uh, uh, human service, uh, uh, human services or so, I can go and use AI to try and find out a little bit more about that person that's going to be interviewing me. So, if I may find out, oh, he likes he likes to go fishing. Well, I like to go fishing. So now I have an avenue of maybe sharing some additional personal information to to kind of supplement what we're going to be talking about on the on the uh, business side. Yes, that's a great idea where where what this is is the contextual data and what you'd want to have is who's stort sacks like you have some sort of you'll have your LinkedIn profile you've probably you have bio, you have different texts whatever it is who you are it, be it you know five or six paragraphs it could be a 20 page document um, not that you necessarily need to do that um, but you're going to, whatever whoever you are, whoever this person is, typically what I find is that their LinkedIn profile is going to be one of your best elements. There's a lot of young people that might not have a LinkedIn profile. So I might have to use something else like a website that they have or anything like that. Stick them together and then say, help me sift through this data. What do we have in common? What do you think they're going to ask me about? What it, What would be the best, what would be the most, you know, the most useful, what is the thing that I know that this person really would be the most impactful on their show? So that, that's an example of, sure. of asking very specific questions to get that kind of output. 
Yeah, I mean, I would I would think if I don't know that much about the company, tell me the history of the company so that I am more knowledgeable about the you know the the company that I am uh, seeking employment with. Well, and that's the thing that's really important. Sometimes ChatGPT won't be able to tell you the history of the company, but you can go in their website, copy their about us, you know, whatever it is, paste it in and say, you know, based on this history, right. now let me, you know, help me to be more insightful in my upcoming interview. All right. Now, now I'm going to play a little devil's advocate on this. Uh, Please. You know, what... You know, what are the possibilities that somebody says, I really want this job, so I kind of need to beef up my my resume. And so you maybe use artificial intelligence uh, in another way in order to make you look better than you actually are. Well, that happens without AI. You know, people do that also. So it's the same issue you have about cheating in universities. So uh, I talk to a lot of universities where they have the same issue of, well, do we let our students have access to chat GPT because they might use it to cheat? And so AI is just like any kind of tool out there. You can either choose to use it to cheat and, and skirt the system. I mentioned that I, I had a concern uh, and I, I went in our earlier conversation. Uh, I asked you, well, couldn't a student in college who's given an assignment to write a thousand page uh, report on something go out and have AI just give them some some prompts and a little bit of information and AI creates a thousand page report. So that is not the student's you know process of putting that report together. It was done artificially. How is how can that impact, say, the educational system uh, where students are not going to be using their brain, they're using their computer to create. So right now, AI is not that smart. So like, I will give you an example. So I've written two books through AI. This summer, I wrote a book called Find Your Next Job with ChatGPT. And that book I wrote in five days. Now, the I wrote what? it in, yeah, five days. Now, I mean, I wrote it in five days and I had to get it edited and all that stuff. But- right. But I had six months of experience. So so AI is great when you say I so if I said to chat to chat GPT, write me a book about finding a job, um, it would be it would write just this very generic thing. However, when I what I said to it was, I have a very specific structure. Okay, there's six steps in the in there's you know determining your career objective. So when you give the AI structure, then I would say, give me some suggestions here. And then it would be, a, then it, then it's, one, it's you kind of have to have a back and forth. So a thousand pages is a pretty tough, that would be a tough one to do. But I wrote a second book and this is an interesting one. Um, and this is what I've been working on the last month is I was doing a podcast with a gentleman who's uh, a specialist for sorority and fraternities. It's a Greek university. And okay. what happened was, is we had this wonderful experience. And he says to me, he goes, Ben, can you write can you help me understand how to use AI for sorority and fraternity recruiting? I didn't know a lot about it. I mean, I was not in a fraternity when I was at my um, university. I said to him, yes, let's write a book and we can do it in two weeks. I did 20 interviews and I interviewed these the, uh, uh, the recruiting uh, heads of different fraternities and sororities and asked them, describe to me your process. And basically, we wrote a 140-page book because there's all these things of data sources. I'll give you an example where, um, okay, so they you have what are called potential new members or prospects, and all you have is a name and their their Instagram information. So I said, okay, well, on when we're talking about prompts and we're talking about contextual data, put on the left side your you, your fraternities main code of conduct, your ethics, your goals, everything. Who are you? Then on the right side, compare that to, and this was an example of who does this person follow on Instagram? So all you have is the 400 people or, or, or uh, pages or causes they follow. And I say, based on this piece of data, this piece of data, give me an output and analysis of their compatibility. 
And it would be able to say, well, you're talking about public service. This person does not have any public service and elements. However, you're more of a Christian based uh, uh, organization. They follow these Christian causes. And so it begins to sow what, you know, based upon these two pieces of data. Now, when I when I enter the conversation with this person, I can have a much better one and I can identify concerns and I can build a, a relationship quicker just based upon these two data points and be able to, to say, you know, there's some red flags. Well, let's know the red flags in advance. We can talk through them because who you, you know, who you follow on Instagram is not a hundred percent of who you are, but it gives just some extra data to right. build that rapport faster. So, so it would then have an ability maybe to, if there's maybe 400, 400 people that are applying to this fraternity or sorority, then it, it could prioritize them based on, all of these categories and everything. So you could then go back and say, well, we're only going to take in, say, 100 pledges. So we've got to go through and take the top 100 prospects. Exactly. That was another one with stack ranking, because what happens is, is that you'll have red, green, yellow. So the red, if somebody has a GPA that's low, they're out. If somebody's right. green, like we know this is the person we want. We've already, you know, for whatever reason, they're, they're, they've passed. It's the yellows. How do you stack rank these 50 people? And I have to pick 15 from them. And absolutely, you'd be able to use AI to take not only now, this is the other question is when you're talking about contextual data, it gets better. It'll reevaluate because you could say, now that I've got their, their Instagram profile, but now I have five comments, observations from the interactions we've had, now recalculate their compatibility based upon this feedback. And it will take that additional information and it will be able to give you a much better readout. All right. So now let, let me try and throw a wrench into this. Perfect. Uh, let, let's say that you've got this list and you said, okay, their, their GPA is very low. So they're probably out. What if their father was a member of that fraternity and maybe two brothers were a member of that fraternity? So that makes them a legacy. If, if that data is put in, even though they have a low GPA, would that move them a little higher on the on the list because they're a legacy? I mean, you could. I mean, this is the point where it's all about this is human yeah. intervention because you could say this red they're red, but oops, here's an exception. Here's an exception. Let's throw them in yellow. And now they become part of that mix right, of analysis. Right. So that that that's what I discussed because it's because there's certain things that are just objective that you don't need AI. I mean, if somebody has a GPA requirement and it's a hard thing, then that's an you know any technology you don't have to have AI can can be able to to weed that out and filter. Um, it's where it's where you get. So what I try to show people is that AI is when you really need that insight to go deeper because you're making this really important decision. And, and a lot of times they'll, be, they'll just have almost anecdotal conversations here. And again, this could be, I'm using this for fraternities and sororities, but it happens with companies. Right. It happens with, with all kinds of organizations where, where you've got to make really important decisions. There's lots of data out there, but it's, it's, it becomes more of an emotional question as opposed to having AI get in there and say, here's how the AI analyzes it. But Again, even if you get the stack rank, that doesn't mean you just pick the top 15 and forget about everybody else. What you do is it gives you that that context. Now you can go in and 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 use a little bit of emotion, have conversations, but it's a much better data-driven conversation than just emotions. Well, and also they may be one maybe one of the top 15 on your list, but they also may be one of the top 15 on three or four or five other fraternity lists. So now you've got the issue where, where the user now has to go back and decide, well, what criteria am I going to look for in each of these fraternities to make the right decision for me? And, and that's the goal. So this is the idea of, yeah. of matching because maybe that person, if you, you know, and, I, and we've discussed this, like right now I have not uh, entered on that, on the, on the, the prospective new member uh, side of the equation, but then you could have it where here are 10 fraternities, here's their, their code of ethics, and here are their, yeah. in, their values and priorities. Here's my background. Give me an analysis of how I rank with these 10 organizations, which ones would be the, the top three for best fits. 
So you could use that on the other way around. And that's the goal is let's get the best fits. Let's get the right yeah. people matched up. So yeah, that's a great point because the the, uh, the fraternity is looking at how to use AI to find the right candidates. The candidate is using AI to find which direction to go into to to uh, narrow narrow their their discussion and their their uh, you know a choice. It that it's that's fascinating to think about that. Uh, I, I want I want to move into another area that that I have been thinking about and that is uh, with cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, where what has has AI done uh, in order to protect uh, us as individuals and also uh, our military and our government so that's a whole that's a different that that gets into a more broader element which is a really good thing to discuss here because that's there's a there's a lot of controversy on this in, in this element here about, about how do you put guardrails around AI? So the first question is using uh, copyrighted material to train large language models, because the large language models work on a trillion pieces of data. Chances are some of that data is copyrighted, but it's hard to prove. Like, did you use a copyrighted book to add to this these data points to be able to understand elements? So that is one that is a very thorny issue. There's there's a lot of legal processes happening. A big part of the Screen Actor Guild strike has to do with AI and for the writers and the actors because those are the the fact is is that their work is being used to replace them. And so that is that's one question here is the ethics and legal elements of the data you can use. The second is security because if I'm a company and I have a pri priority information, I've got social security information, financial data about individuals, you can't tap into chat GPT as a general large language model. So, so from a security point of view, there are people building generative AI models inside of corporations so that the analysis and the data stays inside of the organization. So that's also something to, to be considered about. And then finally, you just have general cybersecurity of people that are either breaking into your personal networks or breaking into these companies that are creating these AI models. Because that if the if the company creating the AI model has a data breach, then it's possible that some of the training data does get accessed in a way that it that it wasn't intended for. So, so is it fair to say that when we see a report where some major corporation has had a data breach and and you know a few million accounts have been compromised, that it's fair to say that perhaps those hackers were using uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, in order to obtain that information? It's possible. I mean, this is again where, where AI is a tool. And yeah. it's always been a cat and mouse game. Hackers are trying to break in. You have the white, the white hat uh, uh, hackers that are trying to stop people from breaking in. Now the hackers are using better language. I was told, and I haven't seen this on my emails, but I've been told that those Nigerian princesses, princes that are offering you millions of dollars now speak better English. So, you know, there's different ways that AI can be used for bad purposes as well as, uh, so a lot of the, the issues still exist. Now you've got people on all sides using AI. Uh, my concern, if I were to say, my, my, if you were to say, what are the biggest concerns? One of them is going to be in the upcoming election, the amount of deep fakes and uh, fake videos, fake audio, fake uh, whatever stories. Be, now you can just create fake narratives quickly. And that's going to be used by people that want to disrupt the election cycle and, I, and for nefarious reasons. That's one example uh, the other, again, is my concern about society. What happens when a particular kind of job disappears because AI can do it five times cheaper than a human? And that's that's something that I do feel like there's a dis there's a societal disruption that's about to happen over the next two years because somebody who says I'm a graphic artist, they might find it difficult once they lose their their income. Like, why are people not hiring me anymore? Or why am I? Why is my business down fifty percent? And that, and a big part of that is because of AI. 
Um, and then you get into some of the more ethical things of how do we teach our children. So, so I'm a big advocate. I call myself dad GPT with my, especially with my daughter. And when she has homework assignments, I, especially when they're really busy work, I've used chat GPT and I'm like, learn it because your generation is going to have to know how to use this technology. This is, this AI is something that I, I'm, I'm a little bit scared about how it's, how our kids are going to be dealing with it because they're going to have, you know, AI, uh, uh, how do you say, companions for emotional support. And, and I mean, I can think of all of these other ways that human interaction might get uh, supplanted because where AI is able to simulate human beings so well. Well, now you are an expert at AI, so you have a have a vested interest in watching, you know, the involvement of AI with your daughter. What about the average the average family that's raising their kids now, knowing that AI is going to play a major part of their futures? What can the average parents today do in order to try and 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 uh, separate that that dependency on AI for their for their children? Well, it's a question you want. I'm going to say that everyone should definitely learn about what AI is, what it can do, because I feel like it's more important to, I think the kids, our children should learn these tools. They should understand how to do text, to generate text content, to be able to do text to image and, and videos. I think that's, that's totally fine. It, it, it is one, again, just general parenting, making sure that your kids are are not staying all the time in front of a computer, get exercise, get out, right. really have them have a passion. But whatever their passion is, whether uh, one of my colleagues, uh, her daughter loves to do bird watching, but I promise you that with that doesn't matter what the, the passion is, that you would then be able to incorporate AI into how they generate content, how they are able to manipulate pictures, things like that. So I'm always, I'm like, this is just another tool out there, but it is the scary part. Is it the, the level of innovation is mind boggling the speed of it. Uh, I'll give you an example that about a month and a half ago, chat GPT came up with this ability for you to take a picture. So I uh, took a picture, for example, of a baseball card. And I said, I want you to, to uh, I want you to uh, describe this in a way that I can list this on eBay. And it literally took, so from a picture, it says, you know, this is a 1968, blah, 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 you know, very good condition. And it kind of went through the corners and how it was from a single picture that I took of it. My father, who's also a memorabilia, has a Japanese magazine. He's like, um, can you, I, I don't know how to describe this. And I took a picture, it translated it, it explained what this magazine was about, why the subject matter is important, how it is from a historical point of view. And, you know, think about that. Think about, and every right. time this comes out, I think of myself, how many jobs are going to be replaced because of this new technology? <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. Tell, tell me a little bit, share, share with the audience. And by the way, folks, uh, periodically we are, we are scrolling uh, bengoldai.com. That's the website. Go into it, follow it. You'll learn a, a lot more. Uh, and you can also reach out to Ben if you have questions or you you have concerns about getting in, uh, more involved in uh, uh, in AI. He'll be more than happy to to uh, field your questions. Uh, but tell me a little bit about your your childhood, your your upbringing. Where where did you grow up, and what did you and 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 have you always had this passion to go into the technology industry or or did you come through the back door to get into it? The way you say that, it's, I, um, I'll, I'll tell you a few things, and that is a really good question. So I grew up in Dallas, and one of my claims to fame is that back in the early 80s, I was a video game champion. So I have, uh, if you look at, there's a 1982 Life magazine that, that features video game players, and I'm on that. In, in there, I, I my claim to fame is I won one of the very first competition that was on That's Incredible. And so I was definitely very interested in technology, video games. However, what's interesting was that I did not really pursue, for example, programming or engineering. I actually went to, uh, I was going to become a diplomat. I lived in Europe for 10 years. I learned to speak several languages. 
And so that was going to be my, my focus. But about 20 years ago, I got back into the technology space and I've, there's a, there's a part of me that is a geek. So we could have, we could get really detailed into AI and some of the things going on. And then there's a part of me that is a, like a sales entrepreneur person. So it is, I, I would never say that I am like this, this person that lives behind a desk programming. That's not me, but I know how to talk to those people. It's fascinating. I, I, you know, you, you kind of glazed over it, but to, you know, you, you were not only a champion, but, but in the, you were the world champion uh, in, in, and received a, a world champion video game title and all. What were the games that you were, you were fascinated with back in the eighties that, that got you into it and got you to a world champion status? So I had, I was interested in a lot of these classic games. So what people will talk about is roughly 1979 to 83 is the golden age of video games. That's when Pac-Man and Space Invaders and Asteroids and Defender and Stargate, these Centipede, Millipede, these are the games that came out, uh, Galaxian, Galaga. Right. It was really the golden age. I The way that I got into that was I just was really obsessed for many years and and I what the way that I was put in contact with the the top video game players is I got into a high score war with the gentleman on a marathon game called Stargate. And a marathon game is one where you can just play forever and you because you keep getting a bunch of free people. And so I made a phone call and found out that the what the world record was, and I stayed on 36 hours and set a world record on a video game. And that kind of got me connected to the community. And started this really cool adventure that I that I did when I was 16 years old. Well, so so now fast forward about 40 years, and and now you know I happen to have a grandson who is is into Fortnite, and uh, what some of the, the the current versions of that are. Your kids involved in in gaming now the way their dad was. Well, what's so funny is I have this conversation with my wife because I. Uh, she she comes from Romania where there wasn't this this culture that that we have, and she's like my my kids uh, have all gone through the Minecraft phase, the Roblox phase, the uh, pretty much all of these these games. And I, I the ironic part is like I look at Minecraft as just I say this is this is Legos in 1980s you know eight bit uh, eight bit <laughs> graphics. I don't understand it, and they spend hours playing it. So. You know, it's an ironic thing that my that 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 I the first time I brought my kids to like an arcade and they're like, well, what do I do with this thing? Like, where's the keyboard? And I'm like, no, you got to put a quarter in and then you have to press, you know, use a joystick, a joystick or press these buttons. And like, really? How does right. that work? <laughs> and, it, and if you were good enough, you'd get a free play <laughs> yeah. to, to go back and do it. It, it, it's 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 amazing the career that you have followed for yourself. I'm I'm also fascinated that you you speak uh, uh, several languages. Uh, learning learning foreign languages does that just come come easy for you, or is it something that that uh, you just have a talent for? I, it's something I'm passionate about. I don't feel like I have a very good talent for foreign languages, but there was a period of time where I lived in Germany lived in Italy, lived in Romania. And of course, being in Texas, Spanish is the other language. So I wanted, yeah. when I lived in a foreign country and I knew I was going to be there for a longer period of time, I did a deep dive and just focused on learning those local languages, practicing, understanding that my first couple of weeks, I'm going to speak really badly. And I was able to make sure that I, that I was around locals and I just find it's much more enriching and engaging to go to a small town in a country, speak their language, get to meet the people. Uh, and I felt like it was a much richer experience whenever I, when I was living in those countries. All right. Now I got to ask you a personal question. Has anybody told you that you look like Stanley Tucci, the actor? Uh, no, I've had, I've had other people that that's the first one. Stanley Tucci. I haven't, I have not been, I don't remember anyone telling me that. <laughs> I happen to, I, you know, I'm fascinated with his career and 
he 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 plays a lot of different characters, but you you just have that facial structure and everything. You look a lot like Stanley Tucci. <laughs> just a personal observation. All right, before before we take off, I want to ask you for maybe a little advice for those people that are watching and listening, and they are all over the country, and they are all ages and uh, and and ethnic backgrounds and all. If somebody wants to learn more about AI and how it can affect them personally and their surroundings, what direction would you point them in? So first of all, I would recommend, so there's a couple of things. I recommend on a personal level, they should subscribe to newsletters and really take a AI first strategy, meaning there, I'll give you two of them that I like. One's called Superhuman, one's called The Neuron. Those are really good those are really good uh, newsletters that can give you the daily updates of what's going on. Second thing is I do offer consulting on an individual organization and enterprise level. So if anybody here is asking the question, like, I think my department, my company could use AI, I will sit down and do a needs analysis and work it from a consulting point of view. And I would just say that there's that this, that being, being an AI expert or be, or learning AI is not something that takes education. You don't have to spend six months getting a degree. My recommendation, one hour a day, you would be able to, in, in 60 to 90 days, really have a mastery or have that ability, be it listening to podcasts. It could be interacting on chat GPT. It's learning the limitations and seeing what other tools are out there. So just remain curious and don't be afraid of AI. Because if you if you do this and you say, um, I'm just going to not worry about it because it's not real. Uh, because I have people who say, you know what? I'm not concerned. I've seen how this chat GPT works. And I'm like, no, you haven't. Uh, you really need to dive deep, not just go uh, superficial. And I think it's safe to say that this is our future. So, you know, if, if you, if you want to remain in the caboose uh, and all that's your decision, but if you want to get up, to the locomotive and help drive the train, you need to have the, the the tools in order to do it. So, you know, folks, you can reach out to Ben Gold and and for consultation and get the answers to your questions. Ben, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing this conversation with me. Uh, I always close my show with Oscar Wilde. I say, be yourself because everyone else is already taken. <laughs> and that's true of somebody like Ben Gold, who is focused on what he is doing. He can share it with you. So I hope you'll join us again next week for another edition of Someone You Should Know. Go out, make it a great day. And again, thank you to Someone You Should Know, Ben Gold. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thank you, Stuart. I really appreciate that. Someone you should know.